This is Steve Saltwick. Welcome to the highlights of my six-part seminar, Your Brain, a Personal Tour. Buckle up, because our task in the next 20 minutes or so is to highlight 4,000 years of brain research. Your brain is a creation of Mother Nature that's as complex as the galaxy we live in. With 85 billion active processors called neurons, your brain dwarfs the world's largest supercomputer, which only has about 10 million or so. Boy, can Mother Nature cook. This papyrus shows that we've studied the brain for over 4,000 years. This document is where the first written symbol for the brain was forged. Much has been learned since then. For example, holding a cold drink in your hand will bias your evaluation of someone. And yes, so will holding a hot one. Nuns do something to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Six-month-old babies make moral judgments. Advanced brains have single cells that detect Jennifer Aniston, and there's a simple reason lions don't eat everyone on a safari vehicle. And you thought scientific research didn't provide snappy patter for cocktail parties. I began my foray into scientific research at the University of Texas. It might look like 4,000 years ago, but it was really 1974. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I was thrilled to publish in science, but nobody got jobs. I could program computers, so out I went into high tech, if you could call it high tech back then. After an early retirement in 2012, I returned to my inner professor back at UT, constructed my seminar. I offer five summary insights beyond the snappy pattern. The first is that there's a clear difference between the sensing of something and the perceiving of something. The rule of thumb is that you sense stuff, like lines, geometric shapes, etc., but you perceive that has become conscious of objects. Let's say, like for example, Jennifer Aniston. We found single cells in the brain which perceive Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer in different clothes, different hairstyles, full face, profile, even the spoken words, Jennifer Aniston. Now, not to be sexist, other cells have reacted the same way to Ryan Gosling, Tom Cruise, and Homer Simpson. Your brain is not born that way. It learns to perceive those objects. A six-week-old baby sees only line segments. So these two figures are judged the same, since the horizontals are the lines are the same, and this line and this line are the same. But by 14 weeks, the babies judge these two figures equal, since the angles are equal. Your perception of an object is affected by whole body sensations. That's why you tend to judge people as cold with a drink in your hand and serious when you have their resume on a clipboard. Object perception begins visually in the back of your brain. This is where we start to perceive Homer, for example. But there's an early warning system. Mother Nature provided it to prepare us for threats, and that's good but it triggers on very selective shapes, large white eyes, snake shapes, and skin colors different than yours. This warning system can also bias your perception. Object perception is also exquisitely tuned to detect alive things by perceiving biological motion. Dots like this are perceived quickly thereby the brain is alive when they move. The ability to detect live biological motion is shared with most animals. Hence the reason this leopard doesn't eat the safari dudes. Sitting in the car, they have no biological motion, but move like those dots in their dinner. Your brain can have an argument over perception. In this slide, your visual system is telling your brain that the orange circles are of different sizes. But if I ask you to reach for these objects with your thumb and forefinger, your finger separation will be exactly equal to the orange shape, which is the truth. So then how does your brain decide how to act? Well, when your brain decides to act, sometimes it's a brain congress, but a surprising amount of time, it is a brain dictator. To understand this, we need to see a rat think. A rat knows where it is using GPS-like cells called hippocampal place cells. The hippocampus is a structure in the base of your brain about the size of your little finger. It is intimately involved in learning and memory. In this S-shaped maze, for example, there would be a place cell that is active when the rat is in the yellow part of the maze, and a different place cell that would be active when the rat is in the orange part of the maze. When the rat faces a choice point, she could go either right or left in this example, hippocampal place cells fire in a sequence for turn right, and then a different sequence for turn left. 
there's another part of the brain that is voting on each choice based on experience. When that vote gets above a certain threshold, the thought about behavior gets committed to actual behavior. It passes brain congress. However, your brain and nervous systems have lots of reflexes, otherwise known as brain dictators. We tend to think of them like this, getting your foot off tacks or Legos. But Mother Nature has given her children complex resource reflexes like this mouse freezing innately at the smell of coyote urine. A reflex mechanism can also be seen in the moral judgments of six months old who observe shapes with eyes helping or hurting each other. Babies will prefer helpers. Isn't that nice? But there's a complicating factor, one that hits hard in society today. Mother Nature also gives most of her children a sense of us versus them. This was good, say, 700,000 years ago, but perhaps not so much today. Here's a baby that likes green beans. Don't laugh, in this experiment, 49% of them like green beans. This baby likes to see puppets who liked green beans, that is, one of us, being helped. But for puppets who like crackers, one of them, a baby likes to see such puppets punished. Such moral reflexes grow as we age. They can be overridden by brain congress, but it takes some work. Mother Nature was also kind enough to give your brain's ancestors greatly expanded areas. And to do what? Well, to eat fruit in a tree. Here is a typical land animal eating food. Grab the food in your paws and start chewing. Rather simple. Now contrast that with a typical monkey eating. The limb he is on is moving. The branch he's reaching for is moving. So finding and eating food is complex. Scientists now believe that the areas of your brain that greatly expanded over evolution, shown here in yellow, mostly relate to the rigors of finding and foraging for fruit in trees. The expanded bits of your brain used for foraging also underpin extremely complex social processes, so advanced that they reach the level of soap opera. The weak are exploited by the strong, alliances are formed and dissolved, dynasties established, and not everybody makes it to survive for the next season. But wait a minute. Eating fruit in a tree is not the same thing as Bach composing and playing a cantata, or Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel, or Einstein and Gödel working out equations. There must be something different and unique about human brains, and of course there are, just not a lot of them. Your brain has only three unique capabilities that I can find. First, an ability to realize the existence of another brain, called a theory of mind or perspective taking. That means considering the perspective of another brain, including the fact that that other may, brain might be holding a false belief. This capability is often confused with empathy. Lots of animals show empathy, in other words, the ability to feel another's pain. Only human brains posit another brain and a fellow member of the species. The second unique capability is a is the ability for language, and not just speech, a full language of sounds, of gestures, and pantomime. And then finally, the third unique capability is a natural instinct to teach, here termed pedagogy. Other animals teach their own young. For example, a mother mongoose will hold a kindergarten to progressively teach her pup to kill a scorpion, but only humans naturally teach skills to unrelated offspring. And then there's the hard question. What about consciousness? It turns out there's a place in your brain with the tongue-twisting name of the temporal parietal junction that is active when your brain is thinking about the thoughts of another brain. Research shows that this part of your brain is active when you recognize your own face. I speculate that it's your brain realizing that it is a brain. Having grown this great big expanded brain, how do you protect it? Well, it turns out there's a pretty simple strategy. Do what nuns do, and do what your parents told you to do. The brain damage that most people are afraid of is Alzheimer's disease. It is the number one concern of aging adults, and any family it touches is substantially affected, if not overwhelmed. The disease is pernicious, affecting your brain de decades prior to presentment. Today, once you're diagnosed, it's almost too late. Your brain has passed the point of no return in many cases. But nuns to the rescue. 
There have been multiple studies with nuns that show a clear path of hope in lowering the risk of AD. Cognitive reserve. Think of it like muscle strength, but for your brain. The constant lifestyle of nuns over multiple decades allow scientists to detect lifestyle patterns which prevent or materially lessen the impact of AD. Having a rich mental life is an excellent way to lower your risk of AD. So we don't have to do everything a nun does or doesn't do. Just ensure we have a rich mental life. We truly owe them thanks, not only for their charity, but also for their assistance in advancing science. To protect your brain even better than the nuns, exercise. If there's a silver bullet for lowering your risk of AD, this is it. Study after study has shown the positive impacts of exercise regardless of when you start, even as they say here euphemistically later in life. And this exercise does not necessarily mean competing in the gym with millennials. Tai Chi, especially in groups, has been shown to be effective. There really is no excuse to do this, if not for your blood pressure, then for your brain. Another method of helping your brain in terms of growing new brain cells is the consumption of DHA. Many of you already take fish oil, and good on you. My point here is that most research is done with DHA from algae, so you absolutely can buy the cheap stuff. It does not need to be from happy fish. Search for the effective drugs for AD have been replete with failure. Promising drugs are found and yet fail in extended tests. However, I'm optimistic. Dozens of drugs are in large-scale tests. Surprising progress is coming from unexpected sources. For example, a common diabetes drug and using ultrasound now both show promise. There are also reports that NSAID, in other words, Advil and Aleve, could help lower the risk of AD because people with rheumatoid arthritis rarely get AD. I do believe we will see effective drugs that can help our, our children, or at the very least our grandchildren, in the near future. I want to briefly touch on one other exciting area of research, the stuff in your gut, the microbiome. Amazing progress is being made in understanding the importance of the over 10,000 species of bacteria in your gut, and the progress is dramatic. For example, the type of bacteria in your gut is a major determinant of the effectiveness of the newest cancer drugs. But for our purposes today, I want to emphasize the link between gut microbes and Alzheimer's disease as well as Parkinson's disease. Recent research has shown that both of these diseases can be caused by the transfer of bacteria from the gut to the brain, most probably using the vagal nerve. This means that what you eat can really affect your brain. And now we get to the second rule of brain health. It's just what your mom told you to do again and again and again. Eat right. That means your vegetables. That means drink your milk. Man, oh man, was she right. Gut bacteria health is dramatically linked to the consumption of probiotics and prebiotics. Probiotics are microorganisms that promote health in general. Here we emphasize brain health. They are most efficiently consumed via fermented food, yogurts, kimchi, and sourdough bread, just to name a few. Prebiotics are food for the probiotics. They're shown here on the left. Getting a good diet in these foods can, heap, can keep your brain healthy and you wealthy and wise for your whole life. The final section of the talk today is how your brain can help the rest of your body recover from trauma. Significant and accelerating progress is being made here, and in some cases, they are nothing short of miraculous. The seminal research was done in just 2008 by Andrew Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh. His lab was the first to connect a monkey's brain via computer directly to a robot hand. The monkey quickly realized that all he needed to do was think about moving the arm, and the arm moved. The monkey assumed the expression of Yoda and the name Jedi Monkey was coined and stuck. The advance in 10 years has been nothing short of stellar. For example, meet Leslie Baugh, a former electrician who lost both his arms in an accident many years ago. Using the techniques refined from the Jedi Monkey, researchers at Johns Hopkins have fitted Leslie with a vest of two robotic arms. Leslie's driving goal is to live independently, and the talisman of that is to put coins into a soda machine and then lift out the can. He is well on the way, and isn't that awesome? 
I'd like to summarize the five key takeaways again one more time. The first is always remember that perceiving Jennifer Aniston or Ryan Gosling is a sign of an advanced brain. Yes, you have a big brain, but don't get cocky. Much of it is for eating fruit in a tree. Considering the perspective of another brain is human unique. Please, please, as in today, don't let this capability go extinct. Four, as hard as it is to admit, your parents were correct. Eat right. And while we're at it, never, ever forget that nuns are awesome at brain health. And then five and finally, consider the fact that all human brains have vestiges of traits like us versus them, which were essential to our emergence as a species. They can and should be overridden with deliberation, brain congress, but they will not go away with training in our lifetime. This concludes the highlights from my seminar. If you're interested in viewing more information, I present the seminar title and the six sessions here. It's on YouTube and it's public. Just search for Your Brain, a Personal Tour, and you should find it. I hope you enjoy discovering more about your brain through my seminars and others. I thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this highlight. This is Steve Saltwick.